Hello, dear colleagues. My name is Alexey Alexeyev. I'm an adjunct professor in the Department of Classics and Religious Studies, University of Ottawa. Welcome to my presentation. Early last year, I was investigating the classical iconographic tradition of Kekrops, the legendary first king of Athens. After reviewing the corpus of material sources, I switched my attention to the literary evidence, particularly the fragments relating the details of Kekrops' appearance. While doing this, I came across an intriguing fragment from Eupolis, a prominent but until recently largely neglected old comedy playwright. In his play Colacus, Spongers of Flatterers, he describes Kekrops as human as far down as the crotch, then a tiny fish from there on down. By this time I had already collected and analyzed a substantial amount of related visual and textual material, so I realized immediately that this peculiar portrayal differed radically from the enduring literary and artistic convention depicting Kekrops in his human-animal manifestation as a serpent-tailed composite creature. What was Eupolis' motivation for choosing this particular imagery? Was this unorthodox iconography the author's pure invention, or was it a smart allusion to a prototype well known to his contemporaries? If the latter is the case, what was its likely source? Because of the isolated nature of the fragment in question removed from its original literary context, speculating on the motivation behind this particular iconographic treatment presents a significant challenge. Gourmelet interprets this unusual representation of Kekrops as a disrespectful mockery of the famous culture hero. Napolitano contextualizes this fragment by focusing on the concept of autochtony and the rich history of one prominent Athenian family, and suggests a possible burlesque treatment, while Ogden sees it as a possible reference to general Dracontes Kete affinity. This paper seeks to provide an alternative interpretation, based on a comprehensive review of the pertinent material and literary evidence, and informed by the theoretical concept of transtextuality introduced by Gérard Genet. Jeanette defines transtextuality as all that sets a text in relationship with other texts. He lists the five main transtextual modes as follows intertext, a proper quotation, plagiarism or allusion, paratext, material that complements the main text and which can change its reception or interpretation by the intended audience. Examples include textual instances such as titles, epigraphs and notes, as well as non-textual or iconic instances, such as book covers, presentation miniatures or illustrations. In the case of theater play, it could be a decoration, costume or portrait mask. Architect, a genre designation that determines the audience's expectations and thus the reception of the work. Metatext, critical commentary and hypotext-hypertext, a relation between a succeeding text B or hypertext and preceding text A or hypertext, wherein text B modifies, elaborates or extends text A without necessarily mentioning it directly. There are two fundamental types of relations between texts, imitation, pastiche, caricature and forgery, and transformation, parody, travesty, transposition, and these have two functional modes, non-satirical and satirical. This inquiry also builds upon the general semiotic view of material artifacts as readable texts. The understanding of coins' iconographic expressions as a type of language is a common notion in the study of numismatic artifacts. The pertinent corpus's fragmentary nature and brevity make a careful application of close reading techniques, focusing on seemingly insignificant details, hidden patterns and textual oddities, particularly beneficial. I will begin by providing a brief overview of the Kekropsis conventional iconography, 
by displaying a few examples demonstrating the tradition related to Cecrops's partially serpentine anatomy. First is the red figure Kilix by the Kodros painter from the Staatliche Museum in Berlin. Here we can see the serpent-tailed Cecrops on the left, observing Athena receiving baby Erichtonius from Gaia. Second, the condensed version of the previous scene, this time from the Melian clay relief, also from Berlin. Here again we can see Gaia handing the child to Athena and Cecrops holding an emblematic olive branch while overseeing the procedure. Next, the red figure zoomorphic return by the Sotades painter from the British Museum. In this painting, serpent tail Cecrops is depicted with winged Nike participating in the libation scene. The fourth example is the red figure Calyx crater by the Cecrops painter. Here, serpent tail Cecrops is depicted in the context of a sacrificial scene. Now let's look at the literary evidence. For this investigation, the fragments from Eupolis's contemporaries and near contemporaries are the most important, and they are few and far between. Euripides, in his play Ion, in detailed ekphrases of tapestries from the banquet tent at Delphi, relates a depiction of Cecrops as winding himself in coils. With one very important exception, to which I will return in a moment, there are no any detailed references to Cecrops' appearance until much later Apollodorus, who depicts Cecrops as having a body compounded of man and serpent. Prior to that, Cecrops was described simply as double-bodied or double-formed by Euphorion, Diodorus, and Athenaeus. I should also mention the rationalizing speculations of Plutarch, referring to the ancient tradition of snake-like Cecrops. And of course, two fragments from the very late Nonus, with a characteristically fanciful depiction of Cecrops with snaky feet that spat poison as he moved, dragon below. Now, the author most relevant to this investigation, Eupolis's exact contemporary and main rival, Aristophanes. In his plays, he mentioned Cecrops five times, but the instance from the wasps is the most important. Philocleon, shouting while struggling with the household slaves, trying to prevent his escape from house arrest and running back to the courthouse. Lord Hero Cecrops, Dracontitis below the waist, will you simply look on when I'm being manhandled this way by barbarians? Here Aristophanes provides a clever joke paraprasdokian, based on the Cecrops' traditional serpent-tailed iconography, juxtaposed with the name of a representative from a prominent family of ancient pedigree. In literary sources, the Dracontides were mentioned repeatedly in the context of court litigation and legal machinations. For example, in Wasps, Philocleon appealing to his unyielding custodians. I've got a case to hear. Do you want Dracontides to get off scot-free? Other examples include Platon Comicus and Demosphenes. The Dracontides' role in the establishment of the post-war oligarchic regime is reflected in the testimonies of Lysias, who writes about the system propounded by Dracontides, Aristotle mentioning the oligarchy facilitating motion proposed by Dracontides of Aphidna, and much later Libanius recalling the reign of terror under Critias and Dracontides. One of the Dracontides was also involved in a high-profile trial, including accusations of public funds maladministration by Pericles, as related by Plutarch. Once again, the Dracontides was the initiator of the process. Needless to say that Cleon, the main target of a ridicule by Aristophanes in Wasps, played a significant role in initiating and prosecuting this trial. Interestingly, in the memorable lines of Wasps, reused a year later almost verbatim in peace, 
Cleon's appearance is described in a pseudo-ophiomorphic manner, with his head encircled by the hundred heads of damned flatterers, similar to Gargon Medusa, with her swirling and hissing snake hair. To place this literary reference in a broader cultural context and provide an iconographic parallel from the material world to these vivid depictions, there are three roughly contemporary electrum coins with the representations of Gargon Medusa. Now, after this contextualizing the tour, let's return to the fragment in question. The Spongers was staged in 421 at the city Dionysia, taking the first prize while defeating Aristophanes' peace, which took the second. Prior to that, in 422, Aristophanes also came second, this time at the Lunaia with the Wasps. The professional relationship between Eupolis and Aristophanes, the leading Athenian comic playwrights of the period, is described as ranging from friendly collaboration and mutually respectful referencing and imitation to vigorous competition and direct accusations of blatant plagiarism. Sometimes this rivalry manifested itself in a mutual public ridicule expressed in a variety of ritualized theatrical forms. These exchanges had very high entertainment value and were always eagerly anticipated and appreciated by the theater audience. Identifying professional competition as the main motivation, I would like to offer an interpretation of Eupolis's Tiny Fish Fragment as a smart parody of Aristophanes' depiction of Cecrops as Drocantides below the waist, as well as a witty joke at his rival's expense. I believe that demonstrated scarcity of Cecrops' depictions in the extant 5th century literary corpus and the very close chronological proximity of the investigated fragments make this conjecture plausible. Here, however, I have to take into consideration Professor Story's observation on Eupolis's peculiar reluctance to deploy parody as a literary device. Maybe the fragment in question is one of the exceptions to the general rule. I would like to suggest that we should treat fragment 159 as a miniature parody which used a technique similar to that of Aristophanes, the supreme master of extended parody, but on a much smaller scale. Now let's turn to the second part of this inquiry, which is concerned with the invention against allusion dilemma. The Spongers satirizes the profligate practices of Callias, son of Hipponicus, who in his best times, according to Cornelius Nepos, was known as the richest man in Greece. Callias was also satirized by Aristophanes in Birds, while Athenaeus and Philostratus referred to his eventual financial demise. There are two legendary traditions about the origins of the Callias's family wealth related by Plutarch, who also informs us on the sobriquet Lacopluti who pit wealthiest, and Athenaeus, who also mentions the abandoned plan to store family treasures at the Acropolis. Young Callias had recently inherited a large family fortune, originating in large part from the exploitation of the state-owned silver mines of Laurion, specifically from the leasing of large numbers of slaves and receiving a share of the proceeds. We know about Callias' inheritance from the testimonies of Lysias and again Athenaeus, and about the investments in silver mines from Xenophon. Here is an ancient artist's depiction of the miner's work from the Corinthian ceramic pinnax hosted in the Antiquin Zamlung in Berlin. What is important in the context of this research is that the Laurion mines served as an almost exclusive material source for the Athenian coin production, including the ubiquitous owls. In birds, Aristophanes draws skillfully upon this fact, 
While developing an ornithologo numismatic joke about the popularity of silver owl tetradrachms in contemporary Athens, particularly among the competition's judges. Money is a prominent subject in the old comedy, characteristically focused on personalized topicality and social themes. This preoccupation was often expressed via money-related humor. The examples from Aristophanes alone are so numerous that it would require a substantial amount of time just to provide brief references, let alone detailed quotations. Eupolis follows this general trend, and his comedies, the Spongers in particular, provide many related references. Could a comprehensive exploration of this prominent financial and monetary subject provide vital clues about how to interpret the tuna-bodied cacrops? I believe the answer is yes. A careful examination of the contemporary numismatic material has identified the most likely visual source of Eupolis' inspiration. These are the cacrops-type electron coins of Kizikus, a major port city on the Propontis and member of the Athenian Arche. The Kizikans circulated widely in the Eastern Mediterranean in the 5th century. They are easily recognizable through the emblematic identifier, the characteristic mint's badge, a tunny fish. Here are three impressive examples of this type from the Munz cabinet of the Staatliche Museum in Berlin, from the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, and from a private collection. As you can see, in all three cases, the tunny fish badge is placed just below the Cacropsis swirling tail. The Kizikus tuna bearing coins were a very popular currency in broad circulation. They were minted in surplus quantities, mainly for export, to satisfy the demand for internationally recognized high value coins. The Kizikans were considered legitimate tender alongside silver, and during the Arche, they were accumulated in great quantities in Athenian treasuries as tribute money. They were also disbursed routinely to facilitate state expenditures, such as operational military expenses. The epigraphic sources provide extensive evidence of these practices. The record of payments from the treasury of Athena enumerates several deposits in Kizikens, including one of 4,000 gold, here meaning electrum stutters. Intriguingly, this epigraphic record also mentions Lysicles, son of Dracontidius, as a treasury secretary. Could this Dracontidius be linked to the one from the wasps? For sure, that would be an interesting historical investigation to pursue. The building accounts of the Parthenon twice mentions gold Kizikian stutters as part of the treasury reserves, serving as a vivid testimony of the important allies' contribution to the Periclean dream. In cities produced in 422, just one year before Spongers, Eupolis informs us that the city's tribute was brought to Athens during the Great Dionysia. Prior to that, in Acarnians, produced in 425, Aristophanes also indicates that the tribute was delivered in the spring. Importantly, in Knights, Aristophanes compares ships delivering the city's tribute to shoals of tuna and Cleon to tuna fisher or tuna watcher. The Kizikans were also favored for hoarding and private savings as Athenian logographer and orator Lysias testifies, recalling his own experience being a victim of extortion during the oligarchic regime of the Thirty Tyrants. Among the contents of his money chest, he lists 400 kizikans, together with a hundred darics and three talents of silver. The kizikans featured an extensive selection of imagery, including the types strongly associated with the Athenian mythological tradition. Here are just the three examples, 
Athena herself, Gaia delivering Erichthonius, and Triptolemus riding a pair of winged serpents. Caled and Kroll, in their recent publication on the coinage of the Athenian Empire, suggested the iconographic repertoire of Kizikus stutters communicated the very special relationship, if not the strategic partnership, between two cities, Metropolitan Athens and allied Kizikus. Eupolis's reference to Kizikus full of stutters in cities confirms the city's reputation as a prolific coin producing center. It also indicates that Kizikus coins, which served as one of the principal regional currencies along with the Athenian silver tetradrachm, were well known to the author and his contemporaries. A close reading of the fragment 159 provides vital interpretive clues that help to elucidate authorial intent and characterize the socio-political and cultural context of the fragment's reception. The investigation reveals a complex transtextual construction, wherein Eupolis's Stanifish fragment emerges in two manifestations. First, as a smart parody of Aristophanes' Drocantidis source, itself a caricature of the prominent family's member and possibly an allusion to the contemporary socio-political discourse. Considering the mainly topical and personal humor of Eupolis's works, the verse could then be interpreted as a satirical commentary on the practices of profligacy and corruption among contemporary Athenian elites. The fact that the Spongers won the competition in 421 might indicate that its prominent monetary theme resonated well with the current mood of the Athenian public, and that its main message was well received. Secondly, the fragment can be seen as a numismatically inspired caricature, devised for the clever application of hyperbolic exaggeration and deliberate distortion. Concurrently, the Kizikus Kekrops type coin plays a double role of an autonomous paratextual illustration in contemporary cultural discourse and the hypotextual source in a witty dialogue between the two leading old comedy masters. Could the fragment also be interpreted as an allusion to the chorus's theatrical costumes in cities, or complexities of relations inside the Athenian Empire? There are so many intriguing questions related to this fragment, but because of time constraints, I have to stop here. Thank you.